thank you all again for volunteering your time and your knowledge base um, and your experiences. All right. Oh, okay. Okay, numbers, okay. All right. All right, to everyone who's coming in, hi. Thank you for joining us this evening for what I hope is a riveting conversation about practicing while Black. My gosh, I see, I see so many of my people in here. Oh my gosh. Hi, Kellyanne. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> I see my people. Okay. All right, um, for those of you who are joining, we're gonna start at five after. Um, just as an introduction, a quick introduction, I am Dr. Star Shanzo Tu. I am the moderator for our wonderful conversation. This is a conversation about practicing while Black. Um, the main thing is we want to have a conversation. So if you have any points or any questions, please, please, please feel free to use the chat box. Um, I will be moderating. And in between the questions we already have for our panelists, um, we will um, address your questions or points. Uh, we do want this to be an engaging conversation. All points are great points um, because it we want to spark up a conversation. Like we, um, what our goal is tonight is to have different perspectives. Um, our panelists are from different sectors of pharmacy. So we're getting a well-rounded viewpoint um, this evening. Okay. All right, as we get people coming in. Okay, so it is five after, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. If you didn't hear my introduction, hello, everyone. I am Dr. Star Shans O2. I am currently serving as the new Practitioners Network Chair for the National Pharmaceutical Association. And I am privileged this evening to be the moderator for this wonderful discussion, Practicing While Black. Um, so this is something we did do last year um, to start off. We definitely want to incorporate it. Last day of Black History Month, let's end it with a bang. So. I am joined today by colleagues, friends. I am very excited to moderate and I'm going to allow our wonderful panelists to introduce themselves. We will start with our esteemed president, Dr. Frank Dory. Hi, thank you so much, Star, for Dr. Shanzo too. 
for giving us that introduction. Uh, my name is Frank North, Dr. Frank, Dr. North. I am the current president of the National Pharmaceutical Association, and I am so grateful for the many attendees, uh, whether members or potential members to the National Pharmaceutical Association, for you to join in this conversation. Uh, I am probably going to sit back and add some commentary to the wonderful things that the panelists uh, has, but also share some of my experiences uh, with uh, within the National Pharmaceutical Association. Uh, and then lastly, I, uh, I would uh, hope that you know, with the National Pharmaceutical Association, we serve underserved represent underserved patients and pharmacists 365 days of the year. So you know we are ending our celebration of Black History Month with this conversation. This conversation goes 365.6 uh, in, in within the National Pharmaceutical Association. And then lastly, I've shared with the panelists that I've gotten kind of stuck in a difficult situation. So I might be moving around a little bit, but I, I hope to be a part of the conversation uh, in its entirety. So thank you all so much, Dr. Shan, so too. All right, next we will have uh, our wonderful Zone 5 director, Dr. Martha. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, I am Zone 5 director. I am currently in the middle of a move, but I am now the Global Health and Health Equity Assistant Professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I've worked mostly in underserved areas, uh, global health areas. Um, primary care is my passion, and so that's kind of the field of work and academia that I'm in and where I can kind of give a little more experience on. So that's a short little intro on that. All right, thank you so much. Uh, have Dr. Carter. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. TJ Carter I'm with the uh, NAFA New Practitioner Group. I was invited by Dr. Shans there, uh, Shans Oto. She's a great leader for our group, um, and we're currently working on trying to get some new uh, faces into NAFA. Um, so I'm on the social media side, I'm, I'm sending out, I'm going to be sending out uh, DMs to hopefully students and trying to get them uh, joining NAFA. Um, but as for me, I'm, I'm in the industry. Um, <clears throat> I currently work uh, for a company that's contracted with uh, Regeneron, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, so I service um, like cardiovascular, dermatological and like oncology medications. So yeah, and I have a background or I, I was in uh, retail before um, joining the current company. All right, thank you so much. Uh, last but definitely not least, uh, our future uh, Dr. Martin. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kira Martin. Um, I'm a third year student at Wingate University School of Pharmacy in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, there, I serve as the chair for our Bridging the Gap Committee, um, and I am also on the Bridging the Gap Subcommittee as one of the PSMP chairs as well. Happy to be here tonight. All right, thank you so much. And um, I did introduce myself. I did not give my background. Um, so currently, I am a clinical pharmacist. Um, in the ambulatory care space with Indian Health Service. I am currently in New Mexico um, serving underserved populations, uh, specifically the Native American population. So I'll be offering more of a clinical um, ambulatory care space and working for different, pop different populations who don't look like me. So that, these are the different um, aspects that you will see on this panel. Um, please, 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 uh, if you have a question, if you have a comment, please utilize our chat function. Um, and with that, let's get started because I do want to stay on time. So first question, probably no surprise, what has been your experience practicing while Black? And this can go for anyone.
who would love to answer this so question? I'll, so, so I'll start, even though I said that I was gonna let, like, let the group go and then maybe that would spur up some conversation and then I'll sit back, you know, and, and chill. So I'll take the first blow. You know, I think for, I think for me, largely, uh, you know, practicing uh, while Black was something that honestly, I think was a bit of surprise when I graduated. So I think, I, you know, I went to a historically Black college or university that had a pharmacy school. And despite the numbers being low of the representation of African-American and African-American males, uh, even within that program, I think largely because I would leave the building or I would be surrounded largely by African-Americans in diverse populations at the HBCU, I kind of thought that that was, you know, kind of consistent across the continuum of the profession. And so even though I went to national meetings and different things of that nature, uh, I really, it didn't really connect until I started working around uh, other individuals that um, that came from other schools or other d diverse populations, but then also, um, you know, quite candidly white individuals. Uh, and then when I worked in certain, you know, pharmacies, so I started in community, you know, I'm on a mission to to to, erad to eradicate the word retail in our profession. And so I think what we do in those settings are community pharmacy, but working in some community pharmacy settings, even as a technician uh, in some affluent areas. And so, you know, having uh, microaggressions and different things of, those, uh, of that nature um, uh, communicated to you. And I think, you know, for me, uh, I had experienced those things before, like the buzz terms and like microaggressions and all those things were terms that we use or sexy or different things of that nature that we use in, a, um, you know, in, in our particular setting. So, uh, so for me, I think largely that's what, you know, practicing while Black was for me. And so I found my community uh, and my voice uh, in the National Pharmaceutical Association uh, largely, we'll get probably more into it. I'll, I'll, I'll like kind of pause there, but I was not as active as a student in SNAFA. And so I didn't really see um, the rich diversity in my people in, in SNAFA. But as I became a, a practicing pharmacist, I definitely saw uh, the intimate, more close relationships that I could have with pharmacists that were um, a part of NAFA. And that's what practicing bio black was for me largely. Wonderful points made. Thank you, Dr. North. Would anyone love to add to his commentary? Like what has your experience essentially been like and how has your race or ethnicity played a role in that? Yeah, I'll, I'll second kind of uh, Dr. North's point. Um, on, the, on the opposite end, I went to PWI. So um, I typically was the only Black female in first of my class. Um, but, you know, a lot of the spaces I've lived in, I worked in, in California, you would think it'd be more diverse, but I tended to be the only Black uh, pharmacist. Um, so a lot of the times it is very isolating. I will say SNAFA and NAFA have been kind of the only times. I remember my first like SNAFA conference and walking around and I was like, oh my gosh, mom, everyone here is black and they're all in pharmacy school. Um, that's amazing. And so that was kind of my first time ever seeing black pharmacists. Um, I still have not really ran into black pharmacists in my areas, whether it's academia, whether it's you, surprisingly public health, there's very few of us too. And so it can be really isolating, but then it's also really empowering when you can make those changes with your patients and, you know, the diversity that you're actually working with. Um, and then areas and spaces like this, like NAFA and SNAFA, and just being able to have that, the colleague feel, um, knowing that, you know, you have that experience. But Often it is very isolating and typically you're the only one. So especially those who are listening from the same type of background, you know, these conversations are really important. Okay. And I love the points that have already been made so far. Um, for me, I, um, like Dr. North, I went to an HBCU for undergrad and pharmacy school. So being around being around Black people was not a shock to me, but for high school, it was a completely different um, scenario there. So, which is why I wanted to go to an HBCU. And then I always felt at home. I always felt like I was supported. SNAFA 
was my safe space. NAFA has given me the network and the opportunities that I had like when I was a student. Um, getting into the workforce was definitely, a, it was shocking the microaggressions I did experience being the youngest pharmacist in my district and one of the few black pharmacists in my district um, when I was previously in um, my former role as a community pharmacist. Uh, so that was a lot to experience and unpackage and unpack there. That was, that was an experience. Um, being out here where my primary um, my primary role as a clinical pharmacist, I am serving Native American population. I'm serving the Native American population. So I'm serving a population that is that does not look like me or anything. So that I luckily I do have black coworkers. I do have like a handful of black coworkers. So of course there could always be more. Um, but you know, you kind of just I've just made a point of getting in where you fit in. Like I I don't try to water down like anything necessarily about myself. Of course, I'll, always being professional, always doing my job to the best of my ability. But sometimes we kind of shy away from the fact that, oh, I'm black. Like um, when you're in spaces where you're not or you, the spaces where you're the only one. Okay, so it's like like doc, like Dr. Martha said, I think that it, it can be isolating sometimes, but it's also incredibly empowering. Um, it's very empowering to be in those spaces because you can also open up the door for people who's coming behind you. Like I've had so many people who have reached out to me since joining Indian Health Service. They're like, I didn't know. Actually, some people, they're like, I had no idea that Black people worked for IHS. I had no idea that Black people lived in New Mexico. We are, and we are here. <laughs> so being able, if you're that person who has to open that door and is like, yeah, like people like me work in these spaces. People like me are here. Like it opens the door. So being a vessel to open the door is great. All right, and future Dr. Martin. So um, I had a different experience, sort of. I um, went to HBCU for undergrad. Uh, shout out to those Rams. And now um, the university that I go to is uh, more of a PWI. So at first, my first year there, it was a huge culture shock to me, learning how to um, navigate in a classroom full of people that didn't look like me when I was used to being in spaces where everyone was Black. So that was a very hard transition, but something that I felt was necessary to learn how to work in this space of healthcare. Um, the, but the most important thing for me was to gravitate towards my people and kind of what I knew. Um, and that's what drew me to SNAPA. Um, and doing that has been such an amazing experience. My first conference was the national conference last summer in Atlanta. And again, like Dr. Martha, I was like, wow, everyone here is black. Like there's so many of us. Um, so that's been my experience. It has definitely been a challenge, but um, just knowing where to take up space and be unapologetically you and Black at the same time while still um, serving communities that do look like you or don't look like you at the same time. All wonderful points that have been made. So with that being said, um, how did you overcome any challenges, if any, that you have encountered in the workplace due to microaggressions, due to your race, due to your gender and race, um, because being a black woman in America, being a black man in America, how, how have you navigated those challenges, if any, or how have you navigated the opposite effect, like ha having your race be on display, but in a positive light, whether that's for DEI purposes like diversity or it, how, how have you overcome or embraced that? So I'll start with this one. Um, for me, um, I was blessed to have Dr. Avant um, at the University of Cincinnati. 
Um, and she she really taught us a lot of um, a lot of the vocabulary on how to navigate and call out microaggressions. And um, so I was just really blessed to have her where now um, I actually right after I met her, um, I started recognizing these things in the workplace, like things, little things that people would say. And I'm like, um, I now know what that is. And I now know how to deal with it, where I just ask questions. Um, I just say, what, well, what do you mean by that? What, what, can you explain that a little further? And usually what happens is um, they just stop talking. They'll, they'll say, oh, um, never mind. You know, forget, forget the whole thought, the whole conversation goes away. Um, I, I want to say one time in particular, um, my, my, I was an intern and my pharmacy, it was a pharmacy manager. And she was like, um, you know, you know, uh, TJ, you're one of those, you're one of those, one of those good ones. And I was like, what do you mean by that? You know, a good what? And um, she stopped for a second, thought for, you know, stopped for a couple seconds and was like, um, never mind. You know, I, I, I don't know what, I, you know, we'll move on, then move on. And so um, Dr. Vaughn just blessed me with that and that um, I, can, I can have conversations with um, non-Black people because it's not just um, white people in general that have these types of thoughts and, and things that they say. Um, I, I was just blessed to have that and being able to, to navigate it um, effectively and, and call them out when needed because it, it's like kind of like having a power at this point. Absolutely wonderful point. Um, being able to address in a very in a professional manner is also very important because I've had moments where I'm like I have to like catch myself like am I hearing what I think I'm hearing? <laughs> is this what's being said? Is what I think that's being said, being actually said. So I'm happy that like being able to have the language to address and hold people accountable in those spaces, I think is incredibly important. Does anyone have any further commentary related to any challenges or how you've overcome any challenges related to microaggressions or specifically your race? I will say I wasn't as lucky to know what to do in the beginning. I think when you're training in residency, there's this fear, you know, you don't have that power yet. You're worried about you know, if I say something, is this going to be a bad grade? Is this going to be, you know, am I going to fail this rotation? Am I going to rub my future like job application wrong? Um, and especially because pharmacy is a small world, you know, you don't want to make someone who is not black uncomfortable. Um, and then kind of growing into it, you know, after a few years of just like understanding that I shouldn't be taking this home, I shouldn't be taking it at work, I shouldn't be taking it in these spaces. I think that's how I discovered, as TJ was saying, that questioning, right? As soon as you just ask, what do you mean by that? You know, what? explain that a little more. Um, I think that tends to help, right? And then I know I tend to avoid people, right? I, I like to kind of test the waters, see what those people are like, especially in a workplace, and then navigate it from an angle of, you know, I'm going to keep it professional, but I understand that you have your viewpoints and that's not comfortable for me. Um, so we're just going to keep it professional. And as soon as that personal, I think the boundaries end up being crossed into microaggressions and racism when there is no boundary placed. Um, and often you have to create those boundaries for those people who might not be changing anytime soon. Um, and then you have your allies in the workplace. And they have really shown out for me in the past, right? Addressing it and letting me know, you know, I heard that too. And that wasn't okay. Um, even as simple as hearing that from someone else can comfort you and kind of at least you, at least you're in a place where you feel like, okay, I can come to you when X, Y, and Z does happen. Um, I think that's kind of how, you know, I'm still navigating, right? You never know what's going to come out of a someone else's mouth. Um, and then with patients, it's hard, right? It's your patient. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you, it's, it's a tough place to be, but again, in terms of, you know, I, I will say, you know, it sounds like you might be uncomfortable with me taking care of you. Um, how about I bring someone else into the room, you know, um, you know, or that's really not appropriate, 
but I'll make sure that someone else is able to take care of you. And so kind of creating those boundaries again, because you don't want to take that home. That's that's a lot of trauma for you to take home every day. All those little microaggressions do add up eventually. And those were both great points um, from you guys, especially being a student and for all the other students in here, kind of not knowing um, what to do or go about microaggressions when you hear them and when you see them. And I love the point of just asking, okay, well, what, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? And really just kind of, um, it sucks to have to make people, other people feel uncomfortable, but this is a place that you're working in, that you're rotating in, that you're gonna be with these people for certain amounts of time. So you wanna make sure that you are comfortable as well as them, but also establishing those boundaries so that other people know not to cross them and kind of know how to handle you um, and the things that they say, but in a professional way. Uh, so that's kind of been one of the things that's hard for me as a student, just knowing um, when and when not to say something and wanting to, what knowing what to do about when you're being silent and not addressing it. Um, sometimes the only thing you can do is take it to your classmates or take it to your friends and, hey, this is what was said, what's going on, you know, how do I go about that? Um, but just learning what to do from other mentors um, in terms of microaggressions is really important. I definitely agree with all the points that have been made today. I, I love that boundaries, having boundaries having like because of course we want to be friendly with the people that we work with we want to be cordial we don't want to make anyone uncomfortable but we also cannot you have to protect yourself you have to it's very important to place those boundaries and have people understand that there's a certain level that we need to be on in order to coexist um so I absolutely love these points love these points oh Can I say, sorry I just saw the the open um comment from Kay Kayleen Kayleen I'm sorry if I said that wrong but you know Kayleen Kayleen thank you Reading real tiny over there. Um, I will say in group settings, it's really hard. I, um, uh, in this type of situation, I tend to just open it up to the floor. Is that how everyone feels, right? And just kind of making that eye contact. And that's a great way to stay neutral and kind of not create too much of a tension in a group, but it allows everyone to kind of comment and see where that problem is because things like that shouldn't be said in public, in conferences, in a group, right? That mentality and often pharmacies really white centered. And so these types of conversations tend to happen. And I've heard things like this at conferences in larger groups. And so making that it might not be that you felt comfortable to say that's a microaggression, but making the whole group either confirm or deny what's going on instead of you speaking out loud um, helps defer it. Yeah, and I, and I want to add, and, and I know I saw our president-elect put in the, in the comment something that I was going to uh, to touch on with the future Dr. Martin. One is that, you know, I apologize for you having to experience that and you shouldn't. And I think that that's where organizations like SNAFA and the National Pharmaceutical Association, the Student National Pharmaceutical Association come into place. So when you have those conversations that you can utilize, you know, tools that we probably have not done a great job at. So I'll position that at the outset, but like with our mentoring program, right? So every student should be mentored with us, with, with the practice and pharmacists that can champion that because it takes a long time to develop the, the strength and the muscle to call that out. But as a student, you shouldn't be calling it out, right? That's what we should be doing in ways to create and not, when I say calling it out, not negatively calling it out or disruptively calling it out, unless if it has to get to that point, but it should be, you know, how do we help, you know, colleges and schools of pharmacy develop, you know, policies or develop programs that help them, um, you know, get to that point. And so, you know, I wanted to to to, to make a, a, a point too about microaggressions, you know, and, and I'm very transparent and when I came up with my theme, Black by Popular Demand, it was met with a lot of scrutiny and a lot of scrutiny from Black people who felt like it was uncomfortable for them 
to have to carry the message of what Black by popular demand may mean or how exclusive it might sound, but it's not. It's very inclusive, and we have to really carry the defending of microaggressions, even when it's not centered to us and us as Black people, right? And so, which is why I'm always an advocate for trying to pronounce people's names right. So, you know, when my friend Kellyanne's name came up mispronounced, we we pronounce it right. But I think it's important for us as you know the typical uh, minority it's always having these negative attributes pointed toward us to also call out these um the, these microaggressions when we see them in other uh races and other cultures and other backgrounds because it's 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 super important for us to really be the champion of of, of diversity and so um and so i think that that also is something that you know we need to we have to discuss when we're talking about it yes we're talking about practicing wild black but I've been in situations where I've worked, you know, with Hispanic populations and, you know, because they didn't speak English, a counterpart, Black or not, you know, have said negative things, you know, or, or thought processes about uh, that individual. And so you have to kind of correct them in that moment. So I think, you know, also while practicing while Black, while there might be microaggressions thrown at you, you might see microaggressions thrown at other people and just because they're not thrown at you doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't, you know, champion the defense of, of, of that person and that person's pride and, uh, and experience in that thought process, in that setting. Absolutely. Being an ally is also just as important as like knowing what to do if it happens to you, knowing how to address if it happens to someone else, because I think when we say like calling out, um, like Dr. North said, like it doesn't have to be unprofessional. It does not have to be disruptive. It does not have to be um, negative in any way. It can just be we're stating facts. Like we're call like we're calling out in the sense that we are addressing it, and you can address. And I think a lot of people feel. Like at one point I felt like, oh, it's unprofessional for me to address these microaggressions, even though I feel it because I'm scared of losing my job because someone got pissed at me because I called them out for whether covert or, or overt microaggression. Um, so being able to navigate those spaces and being able um, to utilize the vocabulary, the language to address it in a professional manner, because at the end of the day, we're all pharmacists, pharmacy students. Um, we are in a lot of professional spaces and we're gonna be in spaces with people who do not look like us. Um, and it is still okay. It's still very much important to have a voice in those spaces. If you're the only voice in that space, you need to be in that space in order for change to happen, for change to occur. Can I ask a question? I, I, I just want to get a little bit messy with my, with my question. Um, it's a lot of respectability um, among us because we are pharmacists. Um, and you, uh, it's been brought up several times that uh, we don't want to make people uncomfortable, um, but we're uncomfortable. Oh. We're, we're living uncomfortably. So um, just to just to open dialogue, I'm just curious. Um, you know, what what are you guys? What are what is your guys' thoughts on? Um, do we have to make them feel comfortable with how we're asking? Because I mean, I, I do it in the way that I'm just asking the question that they usually can feel comfortable enough to like either stop or you know keep going or you know they they feel comfortable. But um, how much should we care about their comfortability when we're living uncomfortable? I guess I just wanted to ask that for the panel. Well, that so, was a twist. Yeah. So yeah. So let me go because I might my 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 computer might drop and I might have to join my phone. I think that's an excellent point, right? But I also grew up with you know with with terms that grandma would say, right? And so one of the and, and so one of the things my mom would always say, so not my grandmother, was always one two wrongs don't make a right, right? And so I think you know just because we're feeling uncomfortable doesn't necessarily mean we have to make another person feel uncomfortable but i like your i like your positioning because one of the things that i am feel fearful sometimes in my professional growth is that i am becoming less censored with my with my response right and it's in a respectful way because i feel like just like i want them to respect me 
or the dialogue that we're getting ready to have or that we're going to have that um that that is that is that is mutual right so you know um so i think it's important for us to be able to uh have conversations and one thing that i have not really been able to control most of my life is my facial expressions and so now i'm learning how to uh, allow my my speech and my responses to follow hopefully in a in a respectful manner and and call it out and i think we have you know societal pushback but we have societal support now to say you know we've been doing all these things for 50 years right we've had we've had all of this so-called success and this so-called growth but then we're honestly really fighting some of the same things that our grandparents fought right for in terms of access in terms of equality in terms of you know all these things to resources because we try not to make them uncomfortable right and 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 making someone and making someone understand the value and the history and what we bring to the table is not lessening them right and so um and so i think it's about um it's about that conversation but i you know and so i i i'll yield but i i am in certain situations where someone will say something about someone and instead of saying what did you mean by that i would just ask more questions right to, and then i would you know have um, you know, if it were someone that I knew that I could make a comparison to, right? And so then, okay, this particular person, or we're talking about this particular, um, you know, situation, let's talk about this past situation that happened with this group. What was different about it, right? And so then you're having a conversation that really, I think, pushes them to really see within themselves how there may be some implicit biases and different things of that nature that, that, that's there. Um, so, so that's my thought process is that, no, I don't think that we should be uncomfortable to make someone else uncomfortable, but I also don't think that, uh, I also don't think that two wrongs make a right in terms of, you know, when you're, you know, educating someone on how to uh, engage with individuals that unfortunately they may not have had to engage with in their career. Ooh wonderful points that's made let's continue to shake the room people let's continue to shake the room now on a different note what benefit have what benefits like have you had as a person of color in pharmacy or like in even with like pharmacy because that's incredibly broad in your respective fields in pharmacy how do you feel that being a person of color, specifically being Black, has helped you? Like, or what benefit do you feel like it's played, like, in your in your career? I will say my biggest benefit has to be with patients, um, at least in the field that I work with in terms of underserved care, um, a lot of my patients are minorities. Uh, in my residency, it was mostly Black patients, 90% of them. Um, now it's mostly Spanish speakers and brown, br other brown people, right? Um, and I think the way I can relate is on another level um, that allows me to create a better standard of care for them, right? We know studies, if you have a Black patient and a Black doctor, their outcomes are better, right? And so I definitely think that is my biggest benefit. I mean, that's the hope, right? That we go into pharmacy and we can treat people who look like us. Um, same with students, right? I feel like the I am what I saw when you see that one Black professor and that connection, that feeling. Um, I think that's been really positive in terms of maybe I might be the only Black person in that space, but the inspiration, the hope that you're giving the patience to other students, um, to little kids, to all of that, right? Like I'd have patients who bring in their kids and be like, look, this is my doctor. Or like, you know, you're treating someone who's like your grandma and it, it just, it's a whole different experience. Um, coming from that side of things. I think that's been the benefit. And then as well as being that person to um, to address these situations, right? A lot of the people that I work with have not worked with someone of color, um, let alone a Black female pharmacist. And so opening their eyes and creating that like glass, breaking that glass ceiling for a lot of that time is really good. Like you can see sometimes the like growth in colleagues. Um, I've had colleagues who felt comfortable enough to come and ask those questions. So I know we're talking about shaking it up and making others feel uncomfortable, 
I love that question for those who are overtly racist. Um, but I will say a lot of microaggressions, again, that kind of roots from unconscious bias. And so when you do end up having those conversations and asking those questions, some people will surprise you. And you might that might be a positive thing for you to be in that space and have that learning education for, for those people who might not be so aware of what's going on around them. Wow. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I definitely think being like, like I mentioned earlier, being available, like being able to open the door for those behind you has been a benefit for me. Like I hear all the time, and I mentioned this before, that a, there are not a lot of Black pharmacists in IHS. I find myself explaining where I work, what I do, and like, oh, you work in New Mexico? Like, you work in Mexico? No, New Mexico is an entire state, but we'll get into the geography aspect at another time. Um, so being able to be that representation, especially if you work in a space where there's not a lot of people who look like you, being able to stand up and be proud in those spaces is incredibly important for me. Um, that's a benefit for me personally. Any other thoughts on the benefits of practicing while Black? Mm -hmm. I will say um, one benefit for me that I've experienced um, just still being a student and being in school is knowing that you will get the right answers and what you're looking for or the T, so to speak, from previous students or pharmacists that look like you. And that is just beyond more than I can express because a lot of people sometimes will give you fluff and this is what it is and this is how my experience was. No, I don't, I don't really want all of that all the time. Give, give me the real real so I know what to expect with what I'm about to go through. Um, and that's just been really important for me. And that's something that I hope to give back um, as a future pharmacist to pharmacy students after me and even some of um, my classmates or schoolmates and that are first year students and second year students like, okay, if you want another real deal, come chat, we can talk about it. And this is what's going to happen. So to me, that's always a benefit, no matter what area or space I'm in, but definitely there. Absolutely. And that definitely leads into my next question. What advice would you give to young professional persons of color navigating these spaces? Whether um, in your case, future Dr. Martin, um, being a student, um, my practicing pharmacist on the call, what advice would you give? Because it's, as we, we probably have felt different than of the non-Black individuals. So how, like, how would you inspire, encourage, or just be real? Because it's important to have truth. We need the truth. We do not need all the stuff that sounds good because then we were in it. We're like, I don't know what to do. So what advice would you give? And I would like to direct this to all of the panelists. Um, what advice, um, since Dr. North is joining us, um, what advice would you give to younger pharmacists who are navigating, younger pharmacists of color navigating the workspace? Suddenly, if I just uh, hit my camera so I can move to a different location because I need to get better. Um, Power. But um, but I think, you know, for me, um, you know, I, it's a hard conversation to have, but I think it's important for us to speak up and for us to, you know, share when things are, when the things that made us, uh, makes us uncomfortable. But I think it's also for us to really be able to, you know, uh, have someone to go to, to talk to, especially when we're talking about students uh, and new practitioners. I think that that's uh, super important. Uh, to be able to have that so, so you can make sure, you know, the, the girl is you know, right, you know, uh, experiences that you're in. Um, and so 
So I think I think for me largely that so um you know my 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 faith in president is to always champion for MPSJ, but even even outside of that, you know, one of the benefits of um is that in a student that I was able to raise I know there's some questions about our mentors, but I have wonderful mentors that when I experience something. Then I was able to, you know, pick up the phone and call them, pick up the phone and fix them. And as a pharmacist, I am active, really, really active in APSG. There's all pharmacists being involved in the majority organization as well. But the difference for me is that they make this little conversation. Again, so one on one conversation. So they at work, dealing with microaggressors or dealing with, you know, I was able to pick up the phone. And you know, several minutes and and there was something frank, you gotta you know, you gotta get over you gotta get over this part to, to do this, right? And here's the issue. Uh and those sometimes those things want to hear uh, as well. I think that person uh and then and then a better so I think that that's um that I would tell um uh, you know students and do transitions. Unfortunately you're not experiencing that that someone else has experienced, you should be experiencing it. And here's how we uh, should go about navigating, you know, correcting this particular um, this particular experience. You're muted, muted but I don't know. you're muted. <laughs> you're muted. You're still muted, Star. <laughs> That's always <laughs> fun. That's always fun. Uh, you're breaking up just a little bit, Dr. Norris. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. We love a good technical difficulty. All right. Um, just before, because I do want to hear um, other viewpoints, but I want to make sure I do this before I don't forget, uh, before I forget. Um, in our chat, uh, Kay Brim, this is a question specifically for you, Dr. North. Um, has NAFA addressed these situations with the pharmacy schools, particularly what students may be faced with um, at the professional training sites that students are sent to? So we are working to uh, strengthen our relationship with, with, with deans and college pharmacy. Uh, we do have such points uh, within them, uh, depending on active alumni and different things that we do. So uh, we are working to uh, really have the deans come to our table so we can have those conversations or be involved in those conversations. I think largely part of it is really knowing that they exist. Um, you know, um, so when there are issues that are, uh, that come up that they are addressed, you know, if a, if a student is a member of SNAFA, that it is addressed to the SNAFA executive director and the SNAFA executive director feels, you know, empowered to come and bring it to the board so that we can touch those touch points. If we don't know to what extent, you know, they may be on general, but it would be great to have, like, you know, this is a, you know, a workplace environment that, um, that a student experience X, Y, and Z. What is that relationship, you know, looking like? How can we get that, you know, person uh, that, that calls the action to get more than just training, right? Because I think it's beyond training, but to be immersed with, you know, what they're, how to have corrective action. So, um, so that's something that we definitely have uh, uh, on our, um, our targeting you know, that relationship with so we can do, you know, four things. So I have four, you know, uh, areas that I, Show improvement with uh, the MPH and how we have uh, come through a next pipeline. So, we want to talk about how do we create a better pipeline of, of African American students to the program? And then, how can we help them persist, right? And so, once they uh, persist, and so persist is different than just retain, right? Retain means you might just be stagnated in P2 years until you get kicked out, but persistence is moving through the curriculum um in, in a successful way and then uh postgraduate opportunities right so postgraduate opportunities largely underrepresented by african-americans except for when ashp was called to the carpet about not having 
demographic information, and then all of a sudden, it seems to be an uptick in match rates of African American and other minority people. So, you know, one of the goals is to create a pipeline of postgraduate opportunities for underrepresented and, and minoritized individuals through um, through SAC accredited programs, but maybe programs that are directly tied to the mission of the National Pharmaceutical Association. And then the last is uh, postgraduate, um, is professional development because there are some people that are like, there are some people that are like Martha and, and I, right? I'm thinking on Martha because she's not really young. And she's not really old, but I'm old. And so, uh, you know, we don't want to go back and do a postgraduate opportunity, right? We, we just are looking for ways to increase our professional development to, to, you know, to move the needle. And so those are the four areas that we, you know, have our members, our deans about. And so it doesn't have to be me or a particular person. You know, anybody that can carry that message today. What are, what are our schools and how is the pharmacy doing? To increase the pipeline, and strengthen the of persistence, create postgraduate opportunities, and then support and scaffold the those postgraduate opportunities and that profession through professional development. And I think that then we'll start seeing, you know, uh, meaningful representation. So, um, you know, with um, President North, I'm very happy that we are addressing concerns that the public may have or the pu that the public has. Um, and as a member of the board of directors, I am happy to be a part of the change that is going to come. Um, but definitely continuing the um, previous question, like what advice would you give to what advice would you give to young black professionals um, coming behind you or even alongside of you, whether that is like a mentee, a colleague, a peer? I think when Dr. North is having some technical difficulties, he was mentioning mentors. Um, I say, you know, get as many mentors as you can. And that includes your peers as well. Like whoever you're in pharmacy school with, make a good tight bond. Um, you might disperse throughout the country. I'll, I'll give a shout out to my friends. Um, but we've been able to at least like talk about these things. We might be in completely different fields, but it just helps to know, you know, you are Black in your space. You are a pharmacist. And then I'll say seek out mentors who, you know, you might not have a mentor who is Black and a pharmacist, but I've had mentors in different fields. I had a social worker who was a Black woman who had been working for a while and just being able to talk to her and talk about her space and my space and, you know, giving that advice. Um, so looking out outside of pharmacy also for mentors is also important to consider. Uh, depending on what field you are in, right? So Dr. Carter might have other non-pharmacists in industry and they might have conversations to talk about, right? Like different fields um, also experience the same things. If you feel isolated as a pharmacist and the only Black pharmacist, there's other professions out there who feel just the same. Um, and so seeking out those connections in different spaces is also important to do, um, whether you're a student, whether you're coming out and working, uh, just so that you can have those conversations and release that stress and hear other advice. Yeah, I 100% I agree with what Martha just said, um, because in, in, in the industry, everyone's not a pharmacist. Um, I can say like I've attended meetings, uh, company-wide meetings that um, different groups had to go to. Um, and I was meeting different people that were like engineers, software uh, software engineers, graphic designers, things of that nature. Um, and I kind of just linked with them. I started messaging them and we're, we're like, cool now where we talk regularly, just shooting the breeze or, you know, just talking about the company, how we feel and just, um, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and then I guess to add my own in, I would say um, try, it sounds really cliche, but um, keeping your confidence, um, knowing and trusting your skills. Um, you know, I, I was speaking on my retail experience specifically. Um, I was walking to, into all white spaces with um, all, white, all white patient populations or at least 95, 99%. Um, everybody's white, and you know they're they're asking questions like, you know how to give vaccines? Yes, I know how to give vaccines. Yes, I know the the side effects. Yes, I can tell you this. 
um, but keeping your confidence and keeping your 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 energy up um, in, in finding ways that that do that for you um, for you specifically um, would be my main advice just because you will be you will be tried um, it, it, it's going to come um, but knowing that you're confident in what you're doing and, and what you're talking about um, I think is a major key And with that, Dr. Carter stole my one point that I had here in my notes. Confidence um, is a game changer in so many ways. Even though it seems small, the more confidence you have in yourself, the more confidence other people will also have in you. Um, not only does it make you feel like you've mastered your craft and you really know what you're doing, it influences how you perform um, around your peers, for your patients, um, the much better you feel about yourself, the better you'll do, the harder you'll work. Um, whether it's words of affirmations that get you there. Um, Beyonce is a personal favorite of mine. I am that girl. And that's what I tell myself. So that's what I believe. So whatever has to um, get you to that point, do that. And I mean, it's it's been a game changer for me. As long as I know that I'm confident in myself, then people will see that. And it's just kind of what... Um, your personality exudes like if you just know that you will act that way and that's how people will treat you also I don't know that's all I have to say confidence honestly truly I love that because confidence has been for me it has definitely been a game changer because when I did not feel confident it showed when I felt confident it showed how you how you view yourself is how is how you will present yourself to the rest of the world so you deserve to be in those spaces and i am so grateful and we've talked about mentorship a little bit um but definitely having mentors has been a game changer i will speak so negatively about myself and I have, I have a mentor. I have mentors. I have a few, I have a couple of mentors who absolutely refuse to hear it. They won't hear it. And because of that, it has forced me to look at myself and be like, no, I deserve to be in these spaces. And the only person that can stop you is you. And remembering that and carrying that is incredibly important to do. Um, but I would definitely say confidence, mentorship, um, knowing that you belong in these spaces because imposter syndrome is a real thing. Unfortunately, it's definitely a real thing, but we are all educated. We have the credentials. We have all of the things. So it's just important to know that and act like that. Um, comment that was made. Yeah, let me let me just add to this piece about mentorship. I think it's bi-directional. You know, I, I have been largely empowered by the people that I mentor. Um, you know, I feel compelled to take action uh, based off of some of the things and some of the experience that they may, you know, share. Um, so, you know, I appreciate you uh, care for opening up this can of worms, you know, because I'm from Houston, so, you know, Beyonce is from my hometown, but they give me an opportunity to out the greatest charity uh, in, in, in the nation known to man, Omega Zappa Fraternity Incorporated. And so I mentor a young man um, at the school that I work at, right? And so I work at the pharmacy school that is kind of, you know, separated on, on a different side of the campus, but I mentor, you know, uh, those young men. So uh, every time I interact with them, uh, and, and interestingly, we won't go down this rabbit hole, but I also am on the campus as well, the PWI. But, um, but, you know, interacting with those gentlemen, you know, really uh, holds me accountable, right, to the work that I say that I'm, that I'm you know, going to do and I, and I want to. So I think mentorship, you know, works both ways. I think when we talk about mentorship, a lot of times the person who should be serving as a mentor feels like it's a burden, right? And that's why I feel like they you know, don't have what it takes to survive. So I think it's important, you know, for us to share some of the, the things and the lessons that I've learned. My, my mentee.
see what keeps me looking also young. So I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Okay, I caught myself that time. All right. So accountability, mentorship, confidence. And I love that NAFA is also opening. We have seats at the table. There are seats at the table. We welcome all of the different opinions. We welcome all of the different viewpoints because it helps us as an organization to be better and to serve and to serve better. But I would definitely say that the advice that I have, like, I love the fact that I have mentors. I love the fact that I can mentor because whether you are a student, whether you're a practicing pharmacist, whether you're a retired pharmacist, you can always learn something from someone and someone can always learn something from you. So always be in the space to learn and also don't be afraid to teach. All right. So with that being said, and we talked um, about mentorship, but does anyone have any further points about how have mentors impacted you as a Black professional? Like the importance of mentorship, we have um, a lot of us have already touched on how important mentorship is, but for me, it was a game changer. The encouragement that I've gotten from mentor, the accountability I've gotten from mentorship has been top tier. The encouragement has helped me to further my own career and it's given me the confidence to keep going when things get hard because you you need somebody there to hold you accountable, who sees the best in you, who wants the best for you and encourages you because this field is not easy. So having someone that keeps you going or some people who keeps you going and it's, you can have different mentors for different things. You don't have to just have one mentor. If you have one mentor, that's great. You can have different mentors for different things. So how has mentorship in any capacity helped you as a professional? Uh, I'm on a position this and I'm, I'm on a position this about mentorship too, because as I as things come up in my thoughts and I mute, I'm like, man, I needed to share this with but, but but specifically about mentorship. You know, mentors are similar to parents, right? And so I always tell, you know, my young brothers they are upset about their whatever their parent is doing or whatever or the person is doing that, you know, they don't have like the right answer, right? They just have more experience that can help you like determine like your path, right? And so I am like most people on this call indebted to my mentors. But you know, if you know anything about me, my journey to academia was very non-traditional. And in fact, most of my mentors who I know even to this day, you know, care a lot about me, um, really suggested you know, to kind of hang up, you know, get it into academia because you know, you know, a lot of the checks and the check marks to get there, right? But one of the things that they did it was honest, it was true, but they still encouraged, right? Um, and so I think, you know, it's so important to sometimes our mentors are not not mentors because they're saying things that might be hurtful to us. They're saying things to really help us create a path or to help us work harder and to dig deeper to get to the places that we want to get to. So, you know, I know we talk about mentorship, the, the, the the gateway, you know, to success, but sometimes it's also, you know, countering, uh, listening um, to the mentor, but countering what, what they're telling us. But if we're going to get to the point, then we have to put in much work, right? And so when I go and I go to middle schools and elementary schools, and, you know, young kids, you know, pharmacy, I'm largely talking to them about pharmacy. I talk to them about if you want to be that football player, if you want to be that football player, if you want to be you know, this rap or like, what are you doing? It's going to make you, you know, next LeBron or the next, you know, what, like, what are you doing, right? Because someone is discouraged them from that because one of them out of that group might make it. And I want them to remember me so they can put my name down on Will Collins, right? So that's the, that, that's the goal is to make sure that we are, you know, 
even in speaking the truth to power, that we're also empowering uh, the people, you know, to move forward because there are a lot of, you know, um, people who are not doing that. And so I want to position mentors is that that's one of the greatest things that my mentors have done is that even when they saw me that one thing that they didn't necessarily agree with, if it was on the path to get into a certain place, they still supported it. And so that was so that was absolutely so and I'm gonna talk. You know if I mean, I'm trying to make sure I don't talk a lot because I don't talk but you know um we absolutely love to hear your points, Dr. North. Uh, love the point by Dr. Kov. Um, mentoring is definitely a two-way street. I have learned so much from my mentees and I have learned countless gems from my mentors. My mentors have changed my life and I have, and I'm happy to say that I've impacted those who I have mentored. It is so important. If you have the chance to be a mentor, you are changing someone's life. So do not be afraid. It, a lot of times we say, oh, I don't have enough experience to mentor. Yes, you do. You have enough experience to be a mentor to someone. Sometimes just even being that person that like, if you're in pharmacy school, that student that's coming behind you, if they have questions, if they want to know how something went for you, that is a part of mentorship, being a resource, being available for questions providing encouragement. I don't know where I would be without the encouragement of mentors. So be that for someone else. All right, um, for this next question, I'd like to direct it um, specifically to um, President North and Dr. Martha. Are there any efforts to address slash increase diversity um, like African-Americans in academia Increasing Black representation at this level would increase the confidence and support of Black or Brown students, Black and Brown students. I will say there is a big conversation around it. Um, the amount of action that has gone into it varies <laughs> across the board at every institution. Um, so I will say, like, even my position um, University of Pittsburgh has, this is, I guess, a shameless plug, but they have kind of gone out and done cluster hires specifically towards minority um, academics and, you know, newer practitioners as well. And so those are some efforts versus other places, other institutions are just kind of talking about it. Um, I think the last few years, we've definitely harped on DEI and justice and all of those conversations have finally become commonplace in academia um, and not so much, you know, I, I think we've talked about diversity for forever, but actually doing the actions and actually trying to talk about what the next steps are going to be. Um, you know, I think a lot of the conversations beforehand were how do we get Black students into our schools? But I think a lot of Black students have now talked and said, we don't want to come to a school that doesn't show us at the top level, that doesn't that I'm not being taught by people who look like me. And those conversations are finally happening and those they're being taken seriously, I think. And again, depends where you are, depends on you know, where your institution is at. Um, and so I, I think we are finally seeing some progress there. Whether it's gonna happen quickly, not so much. I mean, I think academia might not be the most attractive uh, job place for a lot of our pharmacists or upcoming or new pharmacists. And so, you know, the pool is small, but I think the more that we open up that pool, even for adjunct and visiting professors and all of those, we're at least seeing our faces in these spaces. Yep, yeah. I agree. There's been, I agree, there's been research done on faculty of representation uh, dating back to like 2003, um, I believe the uh, research was first name Carol, but uh, does some work about representation uh, in academia. But I think largely, you know, the conversation goes beyond just recruitment. Uh, it is equal to you know, um, that uh, faculty experiences, you know, their work in. I know it's at my internet. But, but um, but what experiences? You know, when I talk to different 
uh, organizations externally you know about NCAA. I kind of share about uh, how for so long the conversation has been just about access. And now once you get in the room, right, you're you're in two of many states, right? One of those states is you're kind of in awe of what you see in the room, right? So you kind of you know, get your bearings. Oh, and so you're not like hitting the ground. You may not be hitting the ground right because you're trying to figure out is the ground, how fast is the ground moving. So sometimes it's like jumping on a moving treadmill. And then two, you get into the it absolutely the opposite of what you thought it was. Figure out how you're going to. Um, so we have, we have, you know, this sometimes revolving doors. So there's work, you know, to be done. And I think it's important. One of the things that, you know, I, I can't, you know, that I would regret to say is that, you know, it starts with representation, right? And so representation of practice and pharmacists involved in associations and MPHA, APHA, your state association, and then asking the leaders of those organizations the tough questions about, you know, representation and faculty and students. You recruit faculty and you can recruit students and students can become faculty members, right? And so then you develop that type of connection. A, but it's to what extent those efforts can be uh, promulgated to really have an impact outcomes over the longevity. We can have, you know, representation of faculty uh, entering, but then they exit right, right, right after. Because largely, you know, academia, I can tell you from someone that spent most of his career trying to get into academia. It is not what you think it is from the, from the outside, you know. And so, how are you able to, you know, persist in that environment, to stay within that environment, and then fail? Uh, it's something that you know, beyond just, you know, are we meeting the number of representation? Are we important them to be successful? You know, through assistant professorship, through full professorship, and dean. All right. I love, absolutely love the dialogue that we're having here and the points that have been mentioned. Um, so just um, if anyone else on the panel would like to add to that, to the question, what do you believe can also be done to improve the representation and experiences of minorities in the profession of pharmacy? Does anyone have any additional points that they like to make regarding that? No, no. All right. Wonderful points have been made. Wonderful points have been made. All right. What types of experiences have you encountered as a Black pharmacist or a Black professional interacting with other Black professionals? Like whether that's doctors, nurses, patients. We talk mainly about patients, but what about other Black healthcare providers. And uh, for you, future Dr. Martin, uh, whether that's your rotations, whether that is um, professors, in any of the spaces that you've been in interacting, has it always been positive? Have there been negative um, experiences? Like, what is it like interacting with someone who looks like you, working with someone who looks like you, being in spaces, even though that the diversity pool may be small, working with people who are like you? I guess I'll just comment. Most of the time, it's been absolutely positive, wonderful. You know, we get, we get you can also kind of drop some of that layer of professionalism or um, what is it called when you kind of shift, you know, that dialogue. Um, you're able to have that with people who look like you, even depending on their occupation, whatever it is. I've only ever had one instance of understanding that comment of, you know, all skin folk aren't kin folk, you know. Um, only ever once is a disappointment, but overwhelmingly it's been amazing and just supportive and, um, you know, uh, other residents who look like me and just uplifting each other, um, complimenting each other, uh, you know, hanging out after either rotations or, um, you know, after work and just being able to talk again, it's not really mentorship, but again, that peer mentorship of just being able to talk and, and have those conversations. Um, and being able to kind of look out for each other too when those microaggressions are happening, when 
you know, things aren't okay and you're able to kind of work together. Um, I also think when there are more people of color, depending on, you know, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, uh, you tend to get more respect as two rather than being the only one. So I really appreciate it when I do have other people who look like me in those spaces to kind of, you know, have that, you have each other's back. Um, and that's mainly the experiences that I've had. Yeah, for me, I was, um, I'm, I'm really blessed to have uh, Ryan Marable working with me. Uh, we're on the same team. And so we'll, we'll like call each other on the phone and we're just super professional. Hey man, how's it going? How's the, you know, how's the kid? You know, that, that type deal. And then we text each other. Oh man, that's some bull. What, what's going on with that, bro? Ain't no way, boy. Ain't no way. So, I mean, I, that, that is like, I need, I need somebody like that. Uh, just so I can, I can, um, be myself with, um, and it's, uh, really greatly needed I need it uh, I appreciate him because he he be hitting me up too we we hit each other up um with the nonsense like I mean, did you see that yeah I saw that too that's crazy so um it's uh it's a blessing if you can get it I'll, I'll say that if you can if you can get it you are blessed if not um you're gonna have to find a way to get it outside of your outside of your workplace I definitely agree with that. Um, having, you can have people at work, but it's also very important to have a safe space outside of work as well. Um, your support system outside of work, whether that is friends, family, significant others, um, definitely incredibly important. Um, I, have, I have great friends at work um, who have become more like family to me who are, um, who are Black. And I have had, Unfortunately, some instances where coworkers, because they're black, sometimes some sometimes especially, I I think there's an expectation where if you see something, you just like let it slide. Like if they're like slipping or like not being held accountable when it comes to doing their share of the work. It's like some things, even though like if another coworker who is non-Black sees it, they would never be like that around them. But, oh, it's cool. It's you. You're fine. You get it. There's still a level of professionalism, even with someone who looks like you. There, Yes, there's a comfortability there, but then it's, but then the card of all skin folk aren't kin folk comes up when you're just trying to be the best professional best professional person that you can be so unfortunately I've had those instances where someone isn't the best colleague and they were someone of color and it's awkward it's it's unfortunate but at the end of the day there's still a job that needs to be done and we are held on the same level of accountability and that's good to also hold each other accountable as well as be supportive of one another which is why I love my black colleagues who I'm friends with we hold each other accountable all the time and it helps us perform better as well as you feel like you're being supported does anyone have any other points that they like to make about that yeah I'll speak here yeah I'm not um Oh, go ahead, Kira. Thank you. Um, so for me, it's been nothing but love um, interacting with pharmacists of color, um, my peers, classmates. I have not had uh, the great privilege of having any preceptors that look like me, unfortunately, or even very many professors, but that is why I made sure to gravitate towards SNAFA um, and become a part and make myself very involved in that so that I can get more of those opportunities. Um, even with my classmates and some of y'all, I see y'all on here, thank you for coming. Um, but just knowing that I have peers in the class that look like me, uh, that I can kiki with, if something's going on, I'm gonna shoot an eye over to my sis on the right side or my friends that sit in front of me like, girl, no, what was that? And it's just such, um, it's such a great feeling being able to have those experiences in the classroom and with your peers when you know you can't readily um, 
necessarily have those experiences in the profession yet, uh, but that is why I do encourage um, any students to be involved in SNAPA. It is where I have gotten a lot of my, um, what's the word? Just joy of being a Black student in the pharmacy world and um, becoming a Black pharmacist. And it's like, okay, there are people out there that look like me, even if I don't see them every day on a day-to-day -day basis in the classroom, they are out there. And you just have to go and find them and make those connections with those people. Um, and as long as you have those relationships and continue to build upon that, that's what's really important. I feel like will really progress you in this field, this field that's so small. I completely agree. SNAFA, NAFA is definitely where it's at. My network was built from SNAFA. Some of the best friends that I have uh, who are some of the best people I know are definitely on this call. Um, friends, mentors like I have gotten from my relationships in SNAFA. Your network is your net worth. Um, I have some of my colleagues who have helped me further along who have pushed me in my career have been from SNAP. I can just go down the list. I'm just looking at people and I'm like, I just love you guys because I don't know where I would be if it were not for what SNAFA and NAFA has given me in my career, personally and professionally. Um, speaking of mentors, my mentor, Dr. Terry Smith-Moore is actually on the call. Um, and she put a wonderful comment about AACP trying to um, incorporate more diversity in um, pharmacy students and faculty as one of its strategic priorities and is working with colleges and schools of pharmacy to help work on these initiatives. So I absolutely love that so many organizations are making steps in the right direction. And it's, it's very fulfilling to see and it's very fulfilling to be a part of that. Let's see, keep on time. We are approaching, unfortunately, the end of our wonderful discussion. Does anyone have any questions or points that they would like to make to wrap up our conversation this evening? This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you all so much for your involvement and staying on to hear our wonderful panelists discuss these topics. Well, I can go first and say something. Maybe invite anybody, any of the want to have their mic, you know, uh, but there is, I think, a few things that, you know, I wanted to say I probably didn't say uh, today and some of the conversation. And that is, um, I know it's going to be awesome. Um, and other people uncomfortable of pointing a finger at them for their experience. Do you all hear me? Um, no. I'm gonna go. I think part of the conversation is not about, you know, making uh, anybody feel uncomfortable or pointing the blame at individuals in this work. And I, and I find in my conversation with, with none that counterpart is that it's often sometimes uh, how they feel that is different in the interaction that they have. Uh, with me centered around talking about inclusion and my 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 pride in it being black, and I've had some negative experiences. You know, I, I have not largely shared uh, publicly, uh, but you know, a couple probably uh, last year, not even a year ago, uh, I was assaulted by a leader of a pharmacy organization, not manly assaulted, but physical hands on me uh, because of the representation that we bring. Uh, to the table, right? And so, you know, I have to channel that in how I'm the speaker of the advanced profession, the advanced profession of African American um, people. And so I think that that's important. I think that it's important to understand and to help get clarity on a lot of the things that we believe today by imposter syndrome. There's a lot of stereotype threat where individuals are 
have this pop process to, you know, uh, slip up and, you know, and fall into a, uh, a negative stereotype a culture group, uh, I definitely, you know, have, have experienced that uh, as someone who, you know, stay culturally woke and stay culturally appropriate, uh, appropriate with my community as I navigate this physical journey in my career. Um, but I think it's important for us to um, to really understand that. And, you know, one of the things that I share about my professional journey is, is again, you know, understanding that more than a person, a person than you know, other minoritized individuals experience, um, you know, adversity as well. And it's not a competition. So, you know, I talk about, you know, uh, Kellyanne Cobb, uh, who's on the call. And I, you know, I just have to shout her out all the time because that was one person who she shared her why when we were having a conversation with her. I mean, it was four years ago. Um, and it really you know, like me thinking about that, even though black center in the work that I do, but also doing the work that's inclusive, if not just inclusive to the, the African American way of saying it's about how we can build for everybody, but focusing on who is always usually in the land in every um in every demographic, in every you know, small report that you see. So I think for me that is um what practicing while black is. And so I just wanted to I kind of turn my camera on so you can kind of see what I'm still here talking to you. But I just wanted to thank you, uh, you know, Star Shed too, for putting this wonderful presentation together. Um, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to each and every one of our panelists and each and every attendee who has been on the call for the entire time. It has been, it's been a pleasure to moderate this wonderful conversation. And um, please, 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 if you're not already a member of NAFA and you're a practicing pharmacist, please, please, please join. And shameless plug, if you are on Instagram, please join at NAFA New Practitioners, um, all lowercase, at NAFA New Practitioners, um, to find out what the New Practitioners Network is doing. Also, please follow at NAFA Pharmacy, which is our um, main NAFA page. Uh, we're also on LinkedIn. We also have a Facebook. I believe that's all, Dr. North. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and what else? Is that, those are all the ones you said? I think that's every, everywhere we are. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please make a point of connecting with us because the more faces that we have in these spaces that we're in really makes a lot of change. This uh, will be recorded. So please tell your friends to tell their friends to watch the recording if they couldn't come in person. Um, and again, this has been a pleasure. Thank you all. Um, thank you for everyone who supported our panelists. Um, so we love to see it. Thank you all and have a great night. All right, and...